It is often assumed that the story of type begins with Gutenberg's great invention of movable type for printing. But the Chinese experimented with relief printing for hundreds of years prior to Gutenberg carving entire book pages in reverse from single slabs of wood, then inking them and printing them. They also made a foray into movable type, using characters made from wood, ceramic, and bronze. Since the Chinese character set ranged in the thousands of combinations, they deployed large turntable composing trays to set their type. The Greek alphabet, with its 26 basic characters, offered a smaller character set for typesetting. The Western characters we are familiar with today evolved from Roman characters carved into monuments, as shown here on Trajan's column. We should also keep in mind that Romans had a freehand cursive script used for informal purposes, as seen on this fragment from circa 50 Common Era. From the early Middle Ages in the Mediterranean countries and throughout Europe, script evolved in rich cultural pockets, ultimately settling down between the Nordic fractor or black letter and the more classical humanist hand. When, in the 1440s, Gutenberg conceived of an apple cider press to print pages, he created a way to forge type that could be set and reused again. Being in the city of Mainz, now located in modern-day Germany, the character hand he emulated in type was black letter, almost identical to the fractor style hand being used by clerical scribes of the day. For nearly 450 years, Gutenberg's invention of founding metal type changed almost not at all. Created at the dawn of the Renaissance, the three-dimensional typepiece, known in the trade as a sort, took on human descriptors. A type sort had feet, a body, shoulders, even a beard. Most importantly, it had a face which, when inked, interacted with the paper to create the print. The type is created from a steel punch carved in reverse. The punch is hammered into a softer alloy, such as brass, creating the matrix. The matrix is then inserted into a mold that takes in molten lead, hardened with alloys, which produces a single sort. In this image, you can see the matrices for the typeface Janin, with corresponding lead type visible in the lower left. Note that the matrices are right reading, and the resultant lead sorts cast in reverse. The metal sorts were organized in compartmentalized cases that held minuscule characters in the lower case, and majuscule or capital letters in the upper case, terms which have entered into our common parlance today. The lower case organized the most commonly used letters into the largest compartments in the central area of the case. Note the large space allowed for the lower case E. The double case format allowed space for accented characters, as well as ligatures, for example, the conjoined FI, and diphthongs, or the conjoined AE or OE. Through the late 19th and into the 20th centuries, the lay of the two cases became rationalized and combined into a single wide case, known as the jobbing case. In North America, the California job case became the standard, with the uppercase condensed on the right side of the tray, with the lowercase on the left taking up about two-thirds of the space. Note that seldom used characters, such as those with accents, have been removed from the schematic. Compartments have been allotted for spacing materials that create white space between the words. Printers and typographers rarely change this schematic, with the exception of a few compartments made for sorts custom to the printer's practice. This schematic belonged to a private press specializing in limited edition books. The typesetter stood or sat before the tray and pulled sorts from the case, and assembled the backwards characters upside down in the composing stick, allowing the type to be set left to right. The composing stick was held in a particular manner to allow the composer to use his or her thumb to hold the composed sorts in place while reaching for the case. From Gutenberg's time until the Industrial Revolution, composing sticks would have been made from wood. In the 19th and 20th centuries, composing sticks were normally made from steel. After composing three or four lines of type, 
the compositor would transfer the lines to a wooden, or later, metal galley tray. Once the composition was complete, the grouping of lines of type, called the form, was tied and transferred to the bed of the press, inked, then printed. Here we revisit Gutenberg's famous Bible of 1455, the first European printed book. He printed his book with blank spaces in the text, allowing room for rubrication or the hand decoration of capitals. Gutenberg designed his type not just to emulate the black letter fractor script of his region, but to recreate it so exactly that a less attentive reader would not realize they were reading printed type at all. In the first 50 years of printing, known as the Incunabula period between 1450 and 1500. Printing presses spread rapidly across Europe, as can be seen on this map. Notice the concentration in and around northern Italy, between Venice, Milan, and Florence. Printing exploded in lockstep with the Italian Renaissance, encouraging the reawakening of classical ideals by spreading knowledge, while also absorbing these ideals into the very letter forms used to print. It was a Frenchman in Italy named Nicholas Janssen who first adopted Roman type for printing in the 1480s. This formalization occurred just 30 years after the invention of printing. Note how familiar the typography is to our modern eye. The Renaissance ideal of typography has endured for over 500 years with only stylistic changes to the characters. Around the same time, the italic face made its debut, named after the country that inspired it. Italic is a typographic interpretation of Roman script handwriting. With so much variance and interpretation possible, and in the spirit of the Renaissance, typography developed into an art or science of its own, with characters broken down into parts of greater and greater complexity. As more typefaces emerged, there became a need to display and advertise them to printers, resulting in the type specimen. Throughout the centuries, various revivals of older types came and went. There is no copyright or patent on type characters, since no individual or corporation is permitted to own an alphabetic character. Type designers became the invisible and often anonymous artisans of modern history. In recent times, scholars of typography have organized the styles and types into their own typology, classifying the historic faces into groups. Around 1900, the makers of the linotype machine revolutionized typesetting. Looking like something out of the Jules Verne novel, the linotype machine uses a keyboard to assemble matrices in a line, then inject hot lead into them to create a solid line of type. Hot type made setting easier, but did not eliminate the risk of human error, the typo. Throughout the 20th century, typography thrived, embracing the various art movements and eras as foundries produced more and more typefaces. A decline began in the 1950s, as photomechanical typography began to supplant handset and hot metal type in mass production. By 1980, metal type and hot metal machines were pushed to the back of shops, making room for image setters and later desktop computers. As computers have become more complex and powerful, so too has the popularity of typography, with tens of thousands of typefaces available online. Likewise, professional typographic excellence has re-emerged in digital form as we rediscover the importance of visual aesthetics in the characters we read. So this is a demo of setting type in the Book Arts Lab. Here uh, you can see I'm using a composing stick to uh, place the type characters in a line. I'm using spacers right now to secure the line, basically to fill it in. There I'm using, you can see how it's all tucks in very tightly, but it has to be tight but not too tight. So it's not tight enough yet. So we go to use thins. These are copper and brass uh, pieces that are very, very thin. and they're used almost like shims in between spaces to just get it that extra tightness so it doesn't move around too much. The idea is to keep the type standing on its feet so it doesn't wobble around when it's being printed, uh, which causes wear on the edge of the type. There you can see it's it's standing up on its own now, so it, uh, it's it's quite it's just the perfect amount of tightness in that line. 
going to speed things up here because it's, you know, sometimes interesting to set type, but it's often quite boring to watch. So it shows you how you can set three or four lines in a go on a composing stick. If you go more than that, it begins to get quite heavy after a while and becomes a bit of a strain. So just filling in now, filling up the rest of the section and getting it nice and tight. Looks like I'm there as I slow down again. And there, that is composed type. Here's the, sort of the headline of the, this little composition we're doing. I'm holding it upside down now so you can read it right to left, uh, but up, upside right, whereas it is set the other way around, upside down, so you can do it left to right. This is a composing tray. The composing tray, they used to be out of wood, but now they're metal. You slide the uh, form onto the composing tray, and that way you're able to transport it elsewhere, either to a press or to a composing station. Here's showing the printing actually being done on a, a small uh, platen press, and you can see the end result.